Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction House, and I'm taking a look at a pistol here today that I've gotten a lot of requests to do a video on, and that is the Polish Viz 35, commonly called the Radom. Um, Radom is kind of a misnomer, uh, Radom is the name of the town where these were, where the factory was located, where these were manufactured. It's actually not the name of the pistol at all, but because it's written on the side of the slide, that's kind of become the standard nomenclature for the gun here in the United States. At any rate, um, these pistols were the standard, the new and becoming standard, uh, Polish army pistol in World War II. And what's interesting about them is after Poland was occupied, the Germans actually put this pistol into significant production, to the point that by 1945 this was actually the third most common pistol in German military usage, behind the P08 Luger and the P38. So, a whole ton of these were manufactured. Um, in total, about 46,000 were made pre-war uh, by the Poles, and then an additional 305,000, a third of a million basically, uh, were manufactured by the Germans during the occupation of Poland. So, if we look at this externally, it kind of, the simplest way to describe this would be sort of a 9mm 1911, but that's not really quite accurate. Um, it has some elements much more similar to the Browning High Power, uh, and it has some items to it that are kind of novel for the time. So, taking a look here, let's see, this is our late gun, this is our earlier gun, and we'll, I'll go over the differences in a moment. Um, what we see is a single action gun that actually has a decocking lever, right there, which is a, a kind of unusual feature at the time, uh, 1930s. And then we have a, an automated, automated grip safety, but no manual thumb safety. So those are the distinguishing features of the Viz 35. Now the history of this pistol goes back to the, the mid to late 1920s. Uh, in 1927 the Polish military held its first uh, major pistol trial to figure out what, what was the best automatic pistol out there to adopt for the army, and they tested a bunch of different guns. They tested the, uh, the FN 1903, Browning 1903, uh, the FN 1910-22, the CZ-24 from Czechoslovakia, they tested the P-08 Luger, um, they tested a couple of other guns, and they, their characteristics, basically they wanted kind of a small pistol. Most of what they tested were guns in 380 caliber, and it just kind of happened that when FN brought its 1903 and 1922 models to the testing, they also brought the, the 1926 version of what would become the Browning High Power, and it didn't meet the requirements of the Polish military, primarily because it was far too heavy, um, but they brought it along anyway. And it turns out that they did all, all the testing on the, the legitimate uh, candidates for pistol, and then they also, most of these testing officers, took a look at this Proto High Power and really liked it, despite the fact that it didn't really meet the Polish service requirements. So, so this testing came up with the CZ24 uh, being probably the best gun according to the tests. The FN 1922 was also acceptable and was the least expensive of the guns. And so th there was a follow-up trial in 1929, and once again FN brought along its most current version of the high power. So by the end of this 1929 follow-up trial, the Polish military kind of changed its mind and, and realized that the, the, the high power from FN was definitely a better gun than a CZ-24, and better than everything else that they'd been testing. So they actually made the decision to adopt the high power, and at that point things kind of went awry. Um, the Polish government was also purchasing BAR rifles from FN under the, the moniker WZ-28, and that whole contract process did not go well. Um, there were issues with quality, issues with uh, timetables and scheduling, and it really soured relations between the Polish government and FN. So the planned adoption of the high power kind of fell through at this point because of problems with the BAR contract. So by 1932, what the Polish had kind of decided to do was they, wanted, they still wanted the same pistol, but they figured we've got this local domestic arms industry that we've been putting a lot of money into developing, let's just build this ourselves. So there was a Polish designer who filed a patent in 1932 that covers a lot of the elements of the Viz 35, um, a telescoping recoil spring, uh, guy rod, a couple other elements in there. 
but it was kind of a cleverly done patent to sidestep uh, some of FN's patents on the high power and, and legitimize the Polish manufacture of this gun, which is in many ways kind of a, a copy of the high power. Um, they had certainly, they don't, the, the history in Poland doesn't talk about this being derived from the high power, but it absolutely was. Um, they had been testing those guns, they had seen those guns, they knew how they worked and they liked them. And that's the design that they used as a starting point for this. <clears throat> so the, the interesting debacle, by, by like 1934 they were ready to start producing these guns, but the Polish cavalry department objected. Now in the original design, the way the guns were decocked was to actually use the disassembly lever right here, and what you would do is lock the pistol open using, using the disassembly lever, and then you could pull the trigger and it would allow the hammer to drop, the gun being completely out of battery, uh, the mechanical safety prevented it from firing, but that was how you could decock the gun, was lock it open, pull the trigger, done. Now this was covered in the patent on this pistol, and it seems that the cavalry department didn't really, didn't realize, didn't understand this the same way that everyone else did. The real reason for this thing to have been patented was that the designer was getting paid by the Polish government for rights to his patent claims. And if he had an extra patent claim, that was an extra item he was getting paid for. So this decocking method was really in there as a way for the designer to get more money out of the Polish government. Uh, the cavalry department actually took it seriously, unlike apparently everyone else, and insisted that it wasn't a good enough mechanism for decocking, and they wanted a better one, and they threatened to derail the entire adoption process if they didn't get it. So the engineers went back to the drawing board and spent another year or two figuring out how to squeeze a decocking mechanism into this little teeny bit of a slide back here. And they actually did a quite impressive job. Uh, when we take this apart, we'll take a closer look at exactly how the decocker works. It's, it's pretty slick. Um, there is really some question as to, is, is a decocker really necessary for a gun like this? You know, they'd been around for quite some time. It wasn't like there was a rash of problems and, and fatalities from people accidentally shot while attempting to decock cavalry pistols. But that's politics for you, that's uh, bureaucracy, and that's how the, the development ultimately went. At any rate, by the fourth quarter of, well, 1935 the gun is finished, formally adopted as the Viz 35. Um, this was initially WIS 35, with the W and the S being the initials of two of the men behind the project. Um, that was changed actually when they, as they were doing the decocker, they actually also changed the name to VIS-35, which is the uh, the Latin term for power, and in Polish is pronounced exactly the same. The W is pronounced like a V, so changing it from WIS to VIS didn't change the pronunciation, but uh, eliminated the potential of confusion with things like Webley and Scott, and I suppose they may have wanted it to be a little bit less uh, ego-related for the designers. Anyway, um, by the fourth quarter of, t of uh, 1936 they actually had, had production beginning on the guns and ramped up until by 1939 they were actually at full-scale production. And as I mentioned earlier, they managed to get 46,000 of these guns manufactured and completed by the time the Germans invaded. Now those guns are very nicely finished, they've got uh, Polish eagles on the side of them. When the Germans invaded, they captured the factory at Radom pretty much completely intact and with a whole mess of uh, pistol parts in various stages of fabrication. So the Germans decided that this was a, a good pistol, it was in their 9mm issue cartridge. They decided to continue production, they put the Radom factory under the control of Steyr in Austria, and what Steyr did was, uh, first off they took about 2500 guns, um, and produced them, so these are, they had about 2,500 guns worth of parts that were already finished and just not assembled. So Steyr used those guns as basically practice for assembling and, and getting the factory running, and then they started in on production of new guns. So the German, the fully German produced guns start at the serial number range of about 49,000, and uh, continue up to in, in serial number blocks up to a total of about 305,000. So final assembly was done in Austria, but all the parts fabrication was done at Radom. 
um, that barrel fitting and final assembly in Austria was to prevent theft and sabotage and that sort of thing. Um, however, there was actually, for a couple of years, there was an ongoing uh, scheme by some of the, the Polish workers, many of the Polish workers actually, to smuggle guns out of the factory to provide to the Polish Home Army. And they came up with kind of a clever solution to this. What they did was actually duplicate serial numbers on guns. So the, the German inspectors were checking to make sure that every gun matched, thinking that this would prevent any, you know, anyone from stealing a part because then you'd have a mismatched gun. Um, their inspection regime didn't accommodate for the possibility of a gun being, uh, of a serial number being duplicated. So what, what would happen was the, the factory uh, workers would make two guns, typically they were making about 200 guns a day, and they would duplicate a single serial number each day. So you'd have two guns with the same serial number, they would both, both pass inspection and look fine, and, um, and then one of them could be smuggled out of the factory but that serial number was still accounted for in the final production, and so no one was the wiser. Until September of 1942, when this scheme was discovered, um, about a hundred workers at Radom were rounded up by the Germans. Uh, a bunch of them were sent to concentration camps. Fifty of them were hanged in public at Radom. Um, not a good day for the Poles. And unfortunately, that was the end of that scheme. But, um, and after that, by the way, they added a third Waffenamt proof mark to the guns. It was a slightly different version of the stamp. It was held in very tight security. Um, they, they changed procedures to make sure that this sort of duplication and theft couldn't continue. Now, as the war progressed, quality on these guns decreased, um, the Finnish quality primarily, uh, and late in production they actually developed a, a revised version that did not have the disassembly lever. It was cheaper to produce. Um, the main guns were known as the, the P-35P, uh, Pistol 1935, and then the, the final P was for Polish, uh, indicating country of origin. Uh, this was in, in German service. These later versions without the disassembly lever were known as the P-35P-2, uh, to indicate the second variation. Um, some other simplifications here, they actually replaced the cross pins with rivets, so they are not easily disassemblable. That was simply a way to make them cheaper to produce. And uh, actually, why don't we take this opportunity to take a closer look at disassembly of these and some of the clever design elements that went into the radar. It really was one of the, the highest quality pistols of World War II and uh, a slick design. All right, now there are several different variations recognized by collectors. Uh, the first ones are the actual Polish production guns. I do not have one of those. Uh, the second version, basically the second main variation, are the German production guns with the disassembly lever, and then you have a third variation of German produced guns without the disassembly lever. Those are the three main ones. We have these two here today to take a look at, and we will do most of our looking at this particular one. So this is a decocker, drops the hammer. This is a slide stop. This gun, like a 1911 or a high power, locks open when it's empty. And then this lever is for disassembly. So to disassemble it, what I'm going to do is pull this back and lock it open right there. Now you'll notice on a 1911 there's an extra tube here on the outside of the gun that has um, a spring and a couple of detents for the manual safety and the slide stop. What uh, the poles did was actually, and this is quite clever, the slide stop is held in place by a flat surface on the slide stop pin that's pushed on by the main recoil spring. So they don't need an extra uh, spring and detent here on the side of the frame to hold it in place. All right, so to disassemble this piece, I'm gonna take the magazine out first. And then I need to lock the slide open on the disassembly lever right there. That just holds the slide in place. Now, because this is held in place by spring tension from the main spring, all I have to do to release it is flip the gun over, pull this forward, and it will simply fall out. Just like that. So no idiot mark scratches on the gun like you might get with a 1911. Once that is out, then remove, release the disassembly lever, and the slide comes off the front of the frame. Now I can take my recoil spring, pull it out. It is captive. And I think I mentioned this before, it is actually a telescoping guide rod in there. Now there's good reason for that. 
during initial testing, uh, when they did drop testing on this pistol, they found that from like a six foot drop, it would actually fire when it hit the ground, which is a problem. The way they remediated that was by telescoping the guide rod spring, which made it slightly easier for the slide to bounce out of battery from inertia. And once it was out of battery, the mechanical safety in the gun would prevent it from firing. So that telescoping guide rod was there primarily as a drop safety mechanism. Now, you can pull the barrel out. This has a linkless uh, barrel, similar to the high power. So this angled surface acts to pull the barrel down and push it back up. Um, this is a browning locking style system. And then lastly, we have our decocker. Now, to, so in order to explain the decocker, I want to start by pointing out that we have this little piece sticking up right here on both sides of the ejector. And when I fire the gun, that drops, like so. Uh, now, it works both ways. That goes down when I pull the trigger, and if I push down on that, it will drop the hammer. So, the decocker does two things. You can see that that foot right here that comes down, that impinges on that little piece on the side of the ejector, and that's what trips uh, the sear and, and drops the hammer. At the same time, when you run the decocker, you are also camming the firing pin right there back into the slide. So when I run this lever, by the time this foot comes down and fires the gun, I have automatically pulled the firing pin in so that the hammer won't hit it. So that's how you get a safe decocking mechanism. Now on the later version that doesn't have a decocking lever, this is slightly more difficult, but still not too bad. What you do there is simply pull the slide back until this cutout lines up with the slide stop pin, and then I can do the same thing. The trick here is without the decocking lever, you have to manually hold the slide in the right position while releasing tension on the mainspring, and that's a little bit trickier. Um, so I will leave that one alone. That's That was the advantage of the slide stop, the, the disassembly lever, is it held the slide in the correct position for you when you were doing this. So overall the Viz 35 was a, a well thought out, well designed, and well built pistol. They were quite popular with German troops. They are still popular today with people who recognize what they really are. Um, it is a single stack magazine. Um, so it holds a total of eight cartridges of nine millimeter parabellum. They tend to shoot well, they tend to fit the hand well, and uh, really quite good guns that are underappreciated. Thanks for uh, watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, I've had a lot of people ask me to do a video on the P35 or the VIS 35, and hopefully you enjoyed this one. Now both of these examples are coming up here for sale at Rock Island. If you'd like either one of them, take a look at the description text below. You'll find links to the, the Rock Island catalog pages on both, where you can check out uh, the other guns that they are batched with and the high-res pictures. And if you're interested, you could place a bid on one or both right on the website. Thanks for watching.